This is, uh, this is my favorite lecture to give at Mises U. Some of you are thinking, didn't he say that yesterday? Uh, did you think preferences remained constant? <laughs> Um, this, is, uh, this is one that I do um, fairly regularly. It's, it's kind of my field, uh, if you will, within, within economics. And I, I took this on because in, in graduate school because I thought this has got a lot of problems that will be difficult for markets to solve. And it, indeed, it is one of those areas where people think that markets can't work very well and we need government intervention. And so I wanted to give you just a, a, a brief overview there's only so much I can do in 45 minutes, but a brief overview of how we can look at economic um, and environmental issues with a, kind of an Austrian perspective. Uh, the first thing I wanted to show you is this, this aerial photograph. This is a picture uh, of a border between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And you'll notice, of course, on the right-hand side of the picture, there's a lot of trees. On the left-hand side, it's uh, not a lot of trees, not much vegetation. And that shows, I think, in a very clear way, the importance of economic institutions and specifically markets and property rights in, um, in, in environmental quality. And of course, we're gonna talk later, environmental quality is one of those things we can't really measure. It depends on your individual uh, preferences about what parts of, envir of the environment you care most about and which ones you're willing to, uh, uh, to put in second or third place. So if you look at the Economic Freedom Index um, for Haiti and the Domin Dominican Republic, the Dominican Republic ranks much higher than Haiti does. Um, and this is done some years ago in uh, 2018, I think, the number for Haiti would probably be lower given its current conditions now. Um, if you look at the protection of property rights rating, which is a component of that index, um, the Dominican Republic is uh, rated much higher than Haiti. So uh, bottom line, if you go onto someone else's property in Haiti and cut down trees, uh, that's not going to be likely to generate the same kind of problem for you in terms of uh, uh, you being penalized for stealing someone's property as it would on the other side of the border. So we have much more protection of uh, property in the Dominican Republic than we do in Haiti. Um, we, we can talk about several different aspects of, of environmental issues. One, of course, would be resource use. There's concerns about land use and, and deforestation. What happens if we, are, are we going to run out of oil? Or are we going to run out of some other kind of uh, critical resource? Uh, what about overfishing, uh, recycling? And then we have the other, uh, the externality issue, side effects of our activities, either consumption or production activities. Um, what about uh, smoking, uh, which has secondhand smoke effects on other people? What about the bad smell from paper mills, pollution from factories? Um, litter, uh, uh, fireworks, which might create noise, uh, air, airports, which have uh, uh, aircraft flying overhead. Um, so these are the two basic subsets of issues, but I'd say that the core issue for both of these is property rights. So where we're going to go in the next few minutes is we're going to talk a little bit about subjectivity, efficiency, and the environment. We're going to look at some basic principles for understanding economic environmental issues. Uh, we're going to look at government and environmental crisis. Um, is envir are environmental problems the result of capitalism, or or are they the result of um, uh, government failing in in some way? Uh, what role does government play here? And then we'll look, if we have time, briefly at energy emissions and growth. Uh, energy is key to economic growth. Uh, but energy production does tend to create some side effects. Uh, what happens as people get wealthier? Do we see a trade-off between economic growth and environmental quality? So let's look first at the subjectivity issue. There's a rationale here for uh, 
intervention that you've probably heard if you've taken economics classes and you've been confronted with this idea of market failure. This is the mainstream idea that the, the market doesn't conform to this idealistic textbook model of what should happen according to the theorists. Um, and so compared to this ideal state of the world um, in the textbook, um, we have either underproduction or overproduction of some products creating some externalities, these side effects, the effects on bystanders who had nothing to do with the transaction that's taking place. Uh, you've also heard the public goods argument that because of the free rider problem, people don't pay for a good but can't be excluded from using it and therefore this is categorized as a public good and this is one of those areas where it's commonly argued that markets can't handle uh, public goods. They underproduce these, these goods, the classic lighthouse case. Although I, I've pointed out before that um, actually private entities did fund lighthouses, so the, the actual um, the, the facts of the case don't really match up to the, to, the, uh, to the theorists. And then we have, of course, monopoly and monopsony. I'm not going to cover market power issues here today. So this, this, is, uh, this is the basis for these arguments that if we have environmental problems, it's because of externalities, which markets fail to, to satisfy these uh, fantasy world um, standards of perfection, and therefore government needs to intervene. And first of all, I would criticize this kind of fantasy world um, idea that we know where the ideal point is. And then secondly, even if we could somehow miraculously identify this, this point where uh, markets should be. Um, how do we how do we know that government's going to do anything better? Um, you could make things worse instead of better. In fact, I think that's quite likely. So there are three basic approaches that we see to environmental problems. If you have taken a, a kind of a mainstream class, maybe a, even a principles class that touches on these issues, you'll see the Pigovian approach, named for Arthur, Arthur Cecil Pigou, who was a British economist. Uh, over 100 years ago, who wrote about the use of taxes and subsidies to try to move the market more toward this fantasy world idea where the, where the market should be, uh, taxing those goods that uh, have negative externalities, subsidizing those that have positive externalities. Um, then there's the regulatory approach, also very common, where government forces reductions in emissions using regulation to a, a level that's deemed socially efficient. Then we have the property rights approach, and there are really two variations on this. One is the common law uh, approach, and, and tort law is brought in here by the, the famous uh, Ronald Coase um, and people like Harold Dimsetz. And this is pretty common to see this uh, represented in textbooks um, as, a, as a way of, of, of resolving some environmental problems. We'll talk a little bit about Coase later. And then there's the natural law and torts approach that you would see from people like Murray Rothbard and, and Walter Block and some others in that vein. Um, and uh, the, there are pretty serious problems with the mainstream approaches. You'll hardly ever see Rothbard um, or Walter Block mentioned in a textbook where it's referring to environmental problems or externalities or pollution, anything like that. But the two main problems are, first of all, if we're considering what efficiency looks like from an Austrian perspective, we have to make that a, a strictly individualistic perspective on efficiency. There is no way to come up with a kind of a meta-efficiency, an aggregate efficiency for the economy as a whole, but because that would require us to uh, make measurements that we can't make, to have knowledge that we can't have outside of a market. There's no way for me to tell you personally what is most efficient for you. It is your individual goals that will dictate what is efficient for you. And there's no way for a government bureaucrat to be able to aggregate all of the preferences of millions of individuals and decide what social efficiency looks like. So from the Austrian perspective, efficiency is attained when institutions allow individuals to accomplish their 
goals, to seek out their ends, which cannot be discerned by a government and certainly cannot be pursued by that government. We will see conflicts over the use of scarce goods, but we're not going to try as Austrian economists to try to figure out what the values are of these alternative uses um, from uh, that, that bird's eye perspective, so to speak, of, of government. That's because costs are subjective. Uh, we, we cannot measure costs for another individual. All we can say is, well, as an individual, I see this alternative or this alternative, and I pursue this one, but not that one. Um, all we can do is observe those choices that are made by individual, <coughs> individuals. We cannot measure this from afar. That's impossible to do. But you will see um, graphs like this one here in most textbooks that are looking at these kinds of environmental problems. So you see a, a marginal private cost curve, uh, which is this MPC here, um, and uh, the marginal private benefit curve here, and you'll see that the, uh, the uh, textbook says, well, this, this implies that the, the private sector left to its own devices will pursue the point where marginal private cost equals marginal private benefit, and that will give us QM level of output. And uh, then they'll, it'll go on to say, well, we, we know that there are these external costs, and that means that if you add the extra costs, the external costs, onto the private costs, then what you would end up with is a marginal social cost. How many of you have seen a graph like this at some point in a textbook? Or Yeah, half at least, most of you maybe, have seen this kind of thing. It's, it's very common. And so the argument is, well, because, because the market uh, is giving us QM and we really should be trying to get to Q star, that's our optimal level. Um, the, the market's not taking into account these external costs. And so what we need to do is have the government intervene to try to push us toward Q star and avoid the uh, so-called dead weight loss or welfare loss that you, that you see there is the yellow triangle. And so that dead weight loss then would be eliminated. It's, it's supposed by some kind of appropriate intervention. So that Q star, I'll, I'll remind you, is the result of a fantasy world uh, standard of perfection. We actually can't figure out where that Q star is. We don't know. We don't have the information of that for that without uh, a market process. So the Pigovian approach um, would say, well, we use taxes or subsidies as appropriate to try to figure out how we could deal with this. And so the government then would say, well, we know that marginal social cost is where it is, and marginal private cost is lower than that, so we just impose a tax on the production of this product, maybe a tax on, I don't know, fossil fuels or something, and we, we by imposing this tax, we're requiring that private sector entity to take into account the external costs of the pollution. Uh, and then that would move us to Q star. Well, in order to get to that point, we would have to know where the point is. And again, we, we have, the government has no way of knowing where that marginal social cost curve is. There's no way for government to tax appropriately. Now, some people who are more market-oriented in their thinking and think, well, you know, markets are great. Uh, we'll, we'll apply markets to this problem, but get government to sort of fake a market. And we'll get the government to, to use the market mechanism to resolve this problem. And so they will say, well, let's, let's use tradable permits. I mean, they're trading. It's a market. This sounds market-ish. I mean, if you like markets, you ought to favor this because, I mean, that, that's the argument that you ought to favor this because this is involving some kind of price. In order to do this, you would also have to know where Q star is because the government would have to know how many permits to allow or how many permits to create in this, in this kind of fake market. Uh, if the government's trying to control sulfur dioxide emissions, for example, it might create a permit for every ton of sulfur dioxide that's emitted by a coal-fired power plant. And then as a power plant, you have to decide, do we either reduce our pollution or do we buy a permit? And the price of that permit would indicate the value to the 
industry of avoiding, um, uh, of, of uh, reducing their, their emissions. So um, yes, it does generate a price, but you would, the government, the EPA, would have to know how many permits is appropriate. What's the optimal quantity of pollution to be emitted, which is not zero. Um, but it, it doesn't really get us away from the fundamental problem of trying to figure out where this, this Q star is. It's still a fantasy world. And there is, in both cases, either with a tax or with the uh, tradable permit system, the problem of the possibility of, of misestimating where this marginal social cost curve is. I mean, how do we know that the government's going to get it right? There, there's no way to know if they will. There's every reason to believe that they will, either for political reasons or for other reasons, get it, get it wrong. Even if they're really trying to do the right thing, they're still not going to get that right. And I'm, even, I'm not even touching on the problem of uh, distorting the production structure in this. Uh, we're only looking at this kind of one dimension of how much output is ideal, but we know, and, and you've listened to uh, Per Bylan's talks on, um, on this, that we are altering the production structure by doing this. There are other things that are not going to take place because of either these taxes or these, these subsidies. So if you have different possible estimates of marginal social costs, there's no way, no reason to believe that the government would get it right. And then you'd also have to subtract from any, any reduction of the deadweight loss that you actually were able to obtain. And again, you won't know that you have obtained it or not, but you would also have to think about the cost of bureaucracy, uh, the cost of enforcement, the cost of waste from political lobbying. I mean, lobbying is going on all the time to try to move regulation or move taxation or tradable permit schemes into the direction of one particular industries uh, uh, favor. So um, the coal-fired power plant industry is competing with the natural gas-fired power plant industry, and natural gas people want coal to be regulated more heavily or taxed more heavily and vice versa. Uh, the railroad industry makes money shipping coal back and forth. The pipeline industry makes money shipping natural gas. All of these industries have an interest in a particular method of dealing with this uh, supposed uh, market failure. And so they will, they will weigh in on this and create even further uh, problems. But basically what we're talking about here is an application of the socialist calculation problem. Art Carden has said that the information needed to know whether a particular regulation works quite literally does not exist. And the key difference between firms and governments is that firms have market tests for their decisions Governments do not. There's a, this is from the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics. There was um, a series of articles posted um, a few years ago, uh, published a few years ago in the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics on environmental issues. Um, I, no need to write these sources down. I've got a QR code at the end. And if you follow that, it'll take you to these um, these articles and a number of other sources I thought might be helpful if you're, if you're working on this. And I'll post the PDF of the, of the slideshow there as well when, um, after, after I'm done here. So um, there, there's, then there's the ethics problem. We can't dismiss ethics as a, as a consideration here, even if we could miraculously calculate the efficient quantity of pollution? How, how does this trump the ethical requirement of property rights? Um, so the issue becomes a matter of violating the property rights of another individual. This is something that Murray Rothbard spent a lot of time on in his famous essay, Law, Property Rights, and Air Pollution. And this is not about exceeding some level of emissions, which is arbitrarily determined. This is not about even figuring out what the maximum parts per million of some pollutant might be um, that, that you would want to have. Now, I'm going to skip over this next section because Lucas Engelhardt in his lecture yesterday uh, covered um, game theory and the tragedy of the commons application of that very well. And, and I don't, uh, I'll leave this in the presentation for you to look at online if you want. But um, I'll just mention Murray Rothbard's uh, argument here 
Again, this is, this is from, uh, well, this, this is not from Law of Property Rights and Air Pollution. This is from uh, For a New Liberty, where he says that only private property rights will ensure an end to pollution, that is the invasion of resources. Only because the rivers are unowned is there no owner to rise up and defend his precious resource from attack. If in contrast anyone should dump garbage or pollutants into a lake which is privately owned, he would not be permitted to do so for very long. The owner would come roaring to its defense. Uh, so you'll notice that some of the most severe pollution problems in, in terms of looking at the amount of litter or the amount of, the amount of uh, um, smoke or, or whatever the pollutant might be, that tends to be a lot more um, uh, prevalent in, in, on, on property that is not owned by anyone in particular. Now this, this fellow here, Ronald Coase, um, Nobel Prize winner in economics, uh, very well known. Um, is, if you know anything about Coase, you probably associate this with the idea of zero transaction cost worlds. Um, and the idea that if the government would simply allocate property rights, then people will bargain efficiently to get to the ideal world. Um, and so the Coase theorem says that in the absence of transaction costs, the outcome, that is the amount of pollution, will be the same regardless of the initial assignment of property rights. Now, Coase did not say that he thought that in the real world, transaction cost, the cost of bargaining, was actually zero. I mean, people kind of misunderstand that sometimes about, about Coase. Um, in, 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 in fact, he said transaction costs aren't zero. So for Coase, then courts would have to try to balance costs and benefits because it matters in the Coasean world. Um, and uh, then make a determination on who should have the property rights. Uh, so the Austrian approach stands over against this Coasean approach and says, well, we can't measure these costs and benefits. Instead, what we ought to be doing is figuring out basically who was there first, who had homesteaded that right. So the Coasean approach neglects the problem of subjectivity, of costs and benefits. It gets us, it really, the courts would end up back in that same uh, effort of creating some kind of fantasy world determination of Q star. So Rothbard says, look, um, we can't decide on public policy or tort law, rights or liabilities on the basis of efficiencies and minimizing of costs. We can't aggregate those subjective costs over many individuals or even one other individual. So instead, Rothbard says, let's, let's think about pollution problems as being a problem of invasion or of trespass. The decline in the value of your property now is not an invasion. If you build a restaurant, and then I build one across the street and your business diminishes while mine improves, that's, that's not an invasion. The cons you have no right to the consumers that have been um, frequenting your restaurant. There's no, there's no right to the continued uh, transactions of, of those customers you've, you may be thinking of as yours. They are not yours. Um, so if, if uh, Walmart outcompetes a hardware store, this is not a, an invasion. The, the market value is not something that you are entitled to. Uh, so this gets us to something um, that Schumpeter might call creative destruction. In the creation of some new innovation, an older innovation may lose some value, and that's, that's the market at work. But anyone has the right to defend his, uh, his property against an overt act initiated against it. But Rothbard says you have to establish a causal connection between an aggressor and a victim. Uh, you, you have to be able to prove that beyond a reasonable doubt. So um, what about air pollution, noise pollution? Um, there are conflicting uses of property. Now, I live near an airport. There are very often uh, low-flying aircraft that fly over my house, and I kind of like aircraft. I like watching them. I um, remember having to try to calm some of my neighbors down who were nervous about the thing crashing on the neighborhood, but um, it's it's, it's, I'm not bothered too much by it, but of course if I'm trying to sleep and there's a roaring aircraft um, 
500 feet over my house, I'm a little bit annoyed. Do I have the right to make the aircraft stop? Well, I moved to that neighborhood. In fact, the neighborhood was built after the airport had already been built. The airport had essentially homesteaded the right to continue to create that, uh, that noise. Uh, I came to that situation voluntarily. I can't then begin to complain that they've somehow violated my rights. Uh, same thing for air pollution. Uh, we have conflicting uses of air. I like to use air to breathe, but then I also use air as a dumping ground for some pollutants. I'm outside grilling hamburgers or something, there's pollutants going into the air. Um, I use the air for multiple purposes, so do many people, and then we would have to decide about who has the rights to air depending on who was there first. So uh, what about, this is one of those lectures where there's all kinds of whatabouts, right? I'm sure I'm gonna get a lot of what about questions afterward, but um, the, what about uh, um, insensible um, boundary crossings? Um, what if I'm worried about some kind of radio frequency that I'm being bombarded with that might alter my DNA or something. I don't know what the concern might be exactly, but that's, is that something that I have a, a right to, to stop, to get a court to impose an injunction on the transmitter of those, of those electromagnetic waves? Um, so Rothbard says, look, the proper distinction is between visible and tangible, and on the other hand, sensible invasion, um, which in, in sorry, visible and tangible or sensible invasion, which interferes with the possession and use of the property, and on the other hand, invisible or insensible boundary crossings, which do not, uh, and there, uh, do not interfere with your use of the property and therefore should be outlawed only if uh, harm can be proved. I don't wanna spend a lot of time on his principles of liability. I will, I will let you read Law, Property, Rights, and Air Pollution, which is one of the sources that I've linked in my, um, at, in the end slide. Um, but basically Rothbard lays out some of these, these legal principles which he believes are consistent with preserving uh, property rights. So you have to prove actual harm, the burden of proof rests upon the plaintiff, um, the plaintiff has to prove strict causality from the actions of the defendant to the victimization of the plaintiff. Um, the plaintiff has to prove such causality and aggression beyond a reasonable doubt. I mean, that, that means that, let's say I come down with some disease, I can't necessarily say, well, the airport nearby caused it by emitting all of these gases over my, over my head um, for years. I have to be able to, to prove that this, this was a, something I can establish a connection to. Um, and then there can be no vicarious liability, but only liability for those who actually committed the, the deed. Um, there are all kinds of problems that inevitably we could, we could, complications of this that we could talk about, like what if there are, what about, you know, what if there are multiple emitters? And I, I have trouble identifying a particular uh, emitter. Um, so an example of this might be tailpipe emissions from, um, from automobiles that maybe millions of cars all contribute to some kind of problem that causes me to have health problems. Uh, what, what do we do about this? Well, uh, if roads were privatized, we might be able to identify a much smaller number of road owners that then would be, in a sense, point sources of, of pollution. Uh, we don't have that world. Uh, private road, road ownership is, is very, very limited uh, right now, but that, that might be one way to, to help deal with that. But we, under the Rothbardian way of looking at this, we can't compulsorily join someone into a, into a lawsuit and say, well, you know, you, you, um, you, you're going to be involuntarily attached to my lawsuit. And you're going to become a plaintiff uh, without your consent. I, uh, Rothbard would say that's not, that's not allowable. Let me s turn now in the last few minutes that I have to some issues of environmental crisis. You've probably heard certain stories. They've become almost legend about uh, environmental problems created by, uh, supposedly by market processes uh, 
And I'll just point out a couple of cases here where you, you've probably heard these stories and they're, they're repeated again and again and again in classrooms. In fact, uh, one of you sent me a, a, a paper to look at yesterday that dealt with Love Canal, uh, which has become one of those, um, those, those very common legendary stories of uh, market malfeasance and government rides to the rescue with the Superfund law and make sure that everyone pays up for polluting the property, polluting the ground or water. That's, that's one of those stories that you, you would hear about, even though it's, it's been a long time. So basically, this was a 3,000-foot-long trench from a failed canal project from the 1800s uh, on the outskirts of Niagara Falls, New York. And in the 1920s, it was turned into a dumping ground. Here's a nice big trench. We'll just dump all of our stuff in there. Uh, toxic waste was dumped into that trench. Um, the soil had a lot of clay in it, so that tended to add a, mean, uh, a measure of, of, of waterproofing against leakage. Uh, and then they topped it with a layer of clay, so it's kind of encased in this. Privately owned companies and also the U.S. government, the Army, um, and, and then also the local government dumped toxic waste into this canal. In 1953, the city government, which had been warned by the owner of this canal, uh, Hooker Chemical Company, uh, they, they, the, the Hooker Chem Chemical Company said, you know, there is toxic waste down here and you still want to buy this. And the city said, yes. And so uh, if you don't give it to us voluntarily, uh, if you don't sell it to us voluntarily, then we're going to simply take it under eminent domain. So Hooker said, fine, okay, just so long as you understand that this is, this is what's underground. And so not only did the city government take it, they decided they were going to build a school on top of this canal. Um, one article I've read uh, on this pointed out that Hooker had actually taken great pains to point out that this land had been filled with chemical waste took the school board officials to the property, said, look, we're going to drill eight times down into this and show you what's underneath the ground here so there's no question. And uh, there is, in fact, waste here where the canal was, over here on the outside of the canal, no waste. So it's, it's there, but if you dig into this, then you're going to turn up some really nasty stuff. So they put an explicit warning in the deed. Uh, this is chemical waste. They tried to have some additional special provisions put into the deed saying that you can't put a school on top of it. Um, but then when the school board um, tried to sell land to a developer in 1957, the chemical company, even though they didn't own the land anymore, they objected to this. Um, and so this, this is one, one layer after another of, of government just fouling the situation up. Uh, people living near the canal after they had already, the city had already uh, acquired the land, they start building on it, they're penetrating this clay seal around with their digging. Um, people living near the canal complained for decades about odors and, and uh, substances coming out of the ground. The city government's response was simply to pile more dirt on top. The um, city finally, after a lot of pressure from homeowners in the area, decided to hire a private firm to check this out. And they indeed did find toxic residues in homes and storm drains. And so the city said, well, we'll just put some ventilation fans in the houses. This will take care of it. Um, by 1978, the New York State Department of Health got involved, and they began actually doing some evacuations. Uh, the homeowners got together and said, we're going to force the government to do something about this. And somehow, today, Love Canal is, if you're, if you're taking a class in environmental studies or something, you're, you're going to see, well, see, Hooker Chemical Company, very bad people put bad stuff in the ground, and uh, this is why we need government to save us from terrible people that will put toxic waste in the ground uh, without telling the rest of the story. Um, more recently, you get this story. This has become another one of those kind of legendary cases of supposed market failure. Um, you've probably seen YouTubes uh, of this. There was a movie about this a few years ago, um, Deepwater Horizon. Oil well um, rig 
in the Gulf of Mexico that had a blowout on a well that was about a mile underwater. The wellhead was about a mile down, um, about 41 miles off of the coast of Louisiana. Some oil well, uh, oil rig workers were killed um, in about three months. It took about three months to finally plug the thing, after, uh, during which time about 210 million gallons of crude oil were leaked into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, now, Matthew Novak, who uh, wrote on this on Mises Daily, uh, you can find this on Mises.org, um, said that, look, it, it looks like this is you know, private industry here that is careless about the environment, didn't, didn't take due care to ensure that they wouldn't have these leaks, they were irresponsible to drill in this deep water. Novak says, look, the government specifically passed laws that gave the oil companies incentives to drill in this deep water. Um, the risk is inevitably going to be higher when you're drilling in water that's a mile deep rather than, say, a couple hundred feet deep. So uh, this is a, a chart showing um, the uh, depth of oil wells, and the larger the circle, the deeper, the darker the circle, the more recent. And you can see, obviously, uh, the deep water wells are being drilled uh, more recently because the uh, government had, had created these incentives, um, the, allowing more oil to be taken royalty-free. The government collects royalties on, these, on this extracted oil. More oil would, would be uh, extracted royalty-free if you're drilling in deeper water. So this, this uh, pushes these oil companies to drill in places where leaks are harder to deal with because you're, you're looking at such great depth. Um, this is a uh, kind of a timeline of the, the, the oil well, the Deepwater Horizon spill occurred in 2010, but you can see over about an eight or nine year period here where uh, crude oil being um, obtained from deep water rigs greater than 200 meters deep um, was, was increasing dramatically in the late 1990s. Um, and in early 2000s. This is, this is a response to the incentives that were, that were created. It was something like a five times increase in the amount of oil that uh, oil companies could pump royalty free in deep water. And from 1995 to 2003, something like a 250% increase in the percentage of oil coming from deep water regions of the Gulf. If government had not kind of put its hand on the scales to try to push uh, oil companies in this direction, would we have had Deepwater Horizon? Um, uh, it's hard to, hard to know what would have happened, but it, it certainly seems it would have been less likely. Additionally, you get other factors. I mean, this is, this is deep ocean offshore. It's, it's um, a common access resource in a sense. Um, bureaucratic rights assignments. There's no market prices here. This is royalties imposed by the government. Um, there's a federal cap on liability at $75 million, which is pocket change for an oil company. Now, in fact, the oil company was required to pay much more than that, but that, um, that cap on liability would tend to uh, discourage oil companies from taking as much care as they ordinarily would. It's like uh, an insurance deductible almost, you, you, except in reverse, sort of. So um, that's, that's a problem with, with this, this, trying to use this situation as an example of just pure market failure um, if you're not looking at what the government was doing contributing to the situation. Now, I've talked about risk trade-offs uh, in my lecture yesterday, so I'm going to skip over some of this and, and avoid the uh, duplication. I had a few more things to say about coal-fired power plants, but... Um, uh, let me just say a few things about the bootleggers and Baptists argument. Um, the origin of this is Bruce Yandel, who spoke at right here a number of years ago on, um, on some of these issues. And uh, I think it was an, at an Austrian economics research conference. He was the Hazlitt lecturer at one of those. And he says, look, uh, if, you're, if you're trying to understand environmental regulation, you need to understand what these um, 
what these industries are really doing. I, I came into graduate school, I came into economics, um, thinking that environmental regulators were just pitted against polluting industry and that these are just two entities that are gonna go at each other hammer and tongs because they, they have conflicting interests. And thanks to uh, this bootleggers and Baptist argument and some other things that I began to understand about how regulations are created, I began to understand, you know, industries use regulation to suppress their competition. The bootleggers and Baptist argument says, look, you're gonna see a kind of a strange alliance between, let's say, and, and Yandel's, using La Yandel's language, uh, the, the Baptists, so to speak, who have this kind of moral objection to alcohol, and the bootleggers who don't want alcohol legally sold because their business is selling it illegally. So you get these two organizations that have an alliance for very different reasons. But the, um, uh, the, the coal-fired power plant industry might want certain regulations placed on uh, natural gas and vice versa. You'd see the natural gas industry that stands to gain if coal is suppressed by regulation, the next best alternative for power generation is going to be natural gas. Um, the, the wind power industry might favor, um, or the, rather the, the natural gas industry might favor wind power because if, when the wind's not blowing, you're gonna crank up those natural gas generators. So uh, these, these alliances should not be ignored as we think about why regulation takes the shape that it does in environmental issues. Um, EPA administrator under the Obama administration, Gina McCarthy, announced uh, a, an anti-coal burning clean power plan which drew wide support from the environmental community. Uh, of course, you would expect to see, see this, but in fact, Dirty coal producers in Illinois were among those who would benefit from this because they were able to ship train loads of coal to generators far and wide. Uh, uh, the Obama administration's clean power plan made a lot of people happy, um, environmentalists, producers of clean power technologies, and producers of dirty coal. So if you're a, there are basically two types of coal, clean coal and dirty coal. And if you've got a regulation put into place that requires coal-fired power plants to put in all of this expensive technology to clean your emissions, then it doesn't matter as much whether you're using high sulfur coal or low sulfur, low sulfur uh, coal. Um, and so if you're a producer of dirty coal, the high sulfur coal, and your competition is the low sulfur coal, then you're gonna be very happy to have the requirement that every coal-fired power plant put this technology in place because it means you're gonna sell more of your product and your competition, the clean coal producers, will not. Um, now, I don't, have, I don't have enough time really to go through the energy emissions and growth uh, argument. I've got two minutes left, I think, but I'll just very quickly give you the, the basics on this and you can look at the rest on the PDF that I'll link to in the final slide. I've done some work on this myself to look at, at the relationship between economic growth and environmental quality. And it's, it's environmental quality is, you can't translate parts per million to human well-being as uh, a lot of environmental economists would like. But we can see that there's an interesting relationship between the amount of economic growth and the level of certain pollutants. And it tends to follow, at least in many cases, this relationship you see here on the slide, where uh, if you increase your, you, as your economy grows, you're at first going to see greater concentrations of things like sulfur dioxide and uh, carbon monoxide or uh, water pollutants of various kinds. And then once your income reaches a certain level, that is gonna tail off and eventually begin to decline. Most countries now are on the downslope of this relationship, which means that further economic growth is going to tend to produce a lower concentration of some of these pollutants. So uh, the common version of this is in, in, in uh, a, a lot of um, courses that you may, you may be taking as an undergraduate is uh, 
well, you know, in order to stop pollution, we have to slow down economic growth. And that's, that's just empirically, uh, I, can I say empirically? Uh, <laughs> that's, that's not the case. And so I'd encourage you to look at more of this, this uh, literature too, if that's something that you're being confronted with. I'm getting into some of these questions of, of data, and again, you can look at the, at the, at the slides later. Um, let me just skip ahead to my final, look at all that stuff you're missing. But you can find a lot of stuff there. Um, and this book right here, I uh, saw in our bookstore, Climate and Energy. Um, I contributed a small piece of this, um, but this is something you might want to check out. It's available out here. And uh, I'd encourage you to take a look at this if you're interested in those kinds of knotty uh, climate issues. Thank you very much.